Hi everybody, how are you all going? How's things? Great to be here. So I'm just a little bit late, sorry about that. Um, but it's great to be here and we're talking about fasting today. And wow, fasting is such an interesting subject and it's such a popular subject. I think because it's kind of like a hot topic at the moment, it's very, um, very popular. Lots of people are doing it, lots of people are seeing benefits. Everyone is, is kind of wanting to know, okay, is fasting really as beneficial as I'm told it is? Is fasting right for me? Am I doing it right? Am I eating the right things? And it's like with everything, you know, not one, not, not one fits all, you know, so it's very different. And it really does depend on our overall health. And of course, it also depends on whether we're a man or a woman. So women don't tolerate, you know, excessive changes as much as men. Our hormone makeup means that we're a little bit more sensitive. So I'm going to take you through this over two days. I'm going to answer some questions. I got so many questions on this subject. I got tons and tons of questions. So I'm going to answer some questions. But today I want to give you like a little bit of an introduction. So if you've got some questions, please post them below. Um, and I will try and get to them today. And also I will get to them tomorrow. So I'm going to do question and answer tomorrow. But today I just want to give you a brief introduction to fasting and kind of touch on some of the areas that some of you were interested in. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Naomi Judge. I'm a naturopath and a nutritionist. And I help women connect the dots between their health, happiness and hormones. And the reason I want to focus on fasting is because I've seen that fasting works really well for some people. But for others, it kind of sends them cray cray, anxious, lack of sleep, hungry, stubborn weight, um, just hormones completely out of whack. So it doesn't work for everyone. So I want to try and help you understand if it's right for you. Is it the best thing you can be doing for your health? Or is there something else you can be doing? Or if you are going to do it, how can you do it so it supports you? Supports your hormones, supports your adrenals, supports your metabolism. Because it's not just about throwing yourself into it and withholding food and fasting. So I just want to take you through that today. And if you do have any questions, I'll try and get to them. Or tomorrow I'm going to do the Q&A on fasting because I've got a ton of questions to answer. Hi, Veronica. How are you? I hope you're well. Nice. Thanks for joining. So, I mean, there are so many examples of fasting. There's the 5-2 diet. So the 5-2 diet, for instance, you know, five days normal eating, two days lower caloric intake. You know, that'll be around, for women, you know, around 600 calories, that kind of thing. So that's small meals, small meals a day and, and for a couple of days. That's also like intermittent fasting, you know, intermittent fasting. There's also day on, day off, you know, um, skipping meals, you know, day of eating, not a day of eating. Um, eat, eat, stop, eat, stop. There's tons of things. Sleeping is fasting. Um, I actually prefer macronutrient fasting. So, you know, still eating a meal, but maybe for breakfast, not having carbohydrates for breakfast. So you're actually having a little of a macronutrient fast or doing vegetarian weeks or even days where you're actually doing a protein fast. So I'm actually in favor of macronutrient fast because I think that gives the body a little bit of a um, break from certain macronutrients and it helps the body to adapt to other macronutrients. So I'm kind of all for that. But, you know, there are so many, so many variations and I had so many emails. A lot of people are doing the 5-2. A lot of people have asked me about the 16-8 fast. Now, the 16-8 is probably one of my favorites because you naturally fast when you sleep. And so when we sleep, our body's in very little stress. You know, we're not needing, um, our metabolism's not as fast. We're still needing some energy, but we're not needing as much. So when we sleep, it's actually a good time to, to, to fast. You know, when we sleep, we're not drinking water. When we sleep, we're not going to the toilet, hopefully. When we sleep, we're not getting anxious. So, you know, maybe we're having some vivid dreams. That, that can be possible. But, you know, other than that, generally sleeping is a good time to fast. So if you're having your dinner at 7... If you're having your dinner at seven and not eating the next day until sort of eight, that's a good fast. That's 12 hours already. That's 12 hours of fasting. You don't want to go too much over that. I mean, a 12-hour fast, half a day, that's, that's a good fast. Yeah, Veronica, the macronutrient fast is good. I mean, I, I often do um, protein, two days of, of vegetarian food. I will do just to kind of give, you know, help the body um, cleanse out. You need different B vitamins to, to, 
to digest meat so it helps your body actually reset in terms of the beam up vitamins so i might do two days vegetarian um, and also i normally have a little bit of a fast in the morning from carbohydrates so normally my breakfast is um, a bit of protein maybe some fat and a little bit of a starch fast definitely in the morning and then my lunch and dinner will be a good good mix of macronutrients um so nighttime fasting, that would be my favorite way to fast. So when you're sleeping, you're fasting. The reason being is because you're not as stressed. And when we're stressed and we're fasting, that can put a lot of pressure on your adrenals. It can put a lot of pressure on your cortisol. So if you've got elevated cortisol and you've got a stressful job and you fast, that can just put your cortisol up. Or if you've got elevated cortisol and you fast and you exercise, that can put your cortisol up. It doesn't make sense to fast and exercise. That's a lot of stress going on your body. That's a lot of stress on a female body. And so basically, if you fast and you exercise at the same time, you're kind of, unless it's a yin yoga, let's say if you're doing F45 and fasting, that's basically telling your body, whoa, this, there's a lot going on stress-wise. And the danger there is that your body goes under a lot of stress and it can hold on to weight. So the more you exercise, the less you eat, your body might go, hang on a sec. Are we in starvation mode? What's happening here? Where's our next meal? And women tend to, when they get stressed, the body cortisol triggers women to gain fat and store fat in the tummy area. It's different for women than men. So we do have to take that into account when we're looking at exercise, looking at our stress levels and looking at fasting. Um, oh, Veronica, the pescadarian diet's a good diet to do. It's great for, um, great for weight, great for cleansing. But also if people, a bit yang, if people get a little bit anxious, um, a little bit sympathetic nervous system dominant, the pescatarian diet can actually be very soothing for the nervous system. So it can actually help to level them out. I'm all in favor. And in fact, there are some genetic profiles. There are some people that gain weight when they eat animal meat. But when they have fish, it actually suits them better. So you, so some people it does suit better. And you'll know if you've got um, an MTHFR gene or a COMT gene, um, SNP, you may find that um, a pescatarian diet suits you better. Definitely um, Mediterranean. Mediterranean diets sometimes suit people better. Mediterranean with olives, olive oil, salad, veggies, and um, fish that can, and seafood. That can suit some people very, very well. So the benefits of fasting, there are so many benefits of fasting, okay? So this is, this is why it's so popular, because the benefits are, seem to be huge. The benefits seem to be huge, you know? We've got supporting insulin resistance, so supporting type 2 diabetes, balancing leptin, the appetite hormone, um, anti-aging, so it can help prevent aging, help with Alzheimer's, weight loss, um, help you to gain muscle, help with growth hormone. It's been shown to reduce bad, bad cholesterol, the LDLs, and it's been shown to reduce triglycerides. So if you've got high triglycerides or you've got metabolic syndrome, it can be very, very, very beneficial. It's been shown to help with autoimmune conditions, um, and it's been shown to help you know, in, in times of menopause, those kind of conditions. It also elevates what's called IGF-1, which is a type of growth hormone which is produced in the liver. And so it's been shown to increase that. So growth hormone, so helping with growth, helping with muscle growth, helping with bone growth, helping with energy and virility and that kind of thing. So that's why it's so popular. I mean, as soon as we say something's popular for weight loss, but also it's got all these other benefits. And also going through history... There's lots of religions that do the fasting, lots of people back in time doing fasting. Also, you know, Paleolithic times, we weren't eating all the time. So that's, you know, where, where the emergence of fasting has come from. And even, you know, through the centuries, you know, since the 1940s, we've been having a look at fasting. How can fasting help? A lot of people that are into spirituality, yogis, religions, they fast because they help, They say it helps to connect them to the universe, you know, the, the spiritual universe, so to speak. So it's not, it's not new. It's always been there. And I think this is why it's so popular because it helps us co to connect with our paleolithic times. It seems like it's a healthy alternative to eating all the time. But the problem is if it's not done right. So if it's not done in a healthy way for us. 
So if we look at some of the things that it can help with, so ketosis is one of my favorite things, and there are lots of studies that have been done on ketosis. And this is why we can get that clarity. So when we don't eat for a while, our body starts to go into its stores and it starts to use triglycerides, fatty acids as energy instead of glucose. And this can happen within a short period of time, you know, 24 hours. Unless you're doing a high-fat diet, you can get into ketosis pretty quick. And so what this does is this can creates like this alternative fuel for the brain. So you get this kind of clear clarity, which is fantastic, you know, real clear clarity in the brain. Um, and this, is the, this is when ketone bodies are produced. And this is when people can start losing weight as well. But you have that focus. And that is that focus has been shown to help with, you know, Alzheimer's and dementia. So this is a therapeutic benefit to going to ketosis. So definitely fasting for therapeutic benefits can be beneficial, can help. If you suffer from Alzheimer's, if you suffer from dementia, if you have any brain issues or even brain tumors, fasting and going into ketosis has shown to be beneficial. So I would definitely say as a therapeutic reason for any brain issues, I would do fasting. I would experiment with fasting. I would see how it, how it works on me. And definitely the studies have shown that it can be beneficial. And I would definitely, if I was suffering from any issues mentally with my brain health or I had brain damage, I would do um, fasting to help with that. That's what I would experiment with. And you would know if someone's feeling better pretty quickly because the brain has this amazing way to regenerate itself. And if, if, if you had a very bad memory and you were to do fasting and you were to do ketosis and your memory just came back, or if you had early signs of dementia and there was an improvement or even Alzheimer's and there was an improvement, you could see it pretty quickly. You know, you could see it within a day, two days, three days, some slight change. So that is one of the, that is one of the areas I would highly recommend experimenting with fasting as long as you're getting the right fats and you're going into ketosis. So we're talking about healing the brain here. Um, so that's, that's one of the, my favorite parts of fasting and what fasting can do. Um, so in general, women and men do react differently to fasting. Women, we're much more sensitive to those little changes in the environment, in our diet, in our body, stress levels. It's just because of our hormones. So, you know, we have this nice slow pump of follicle stimulating hormone, this slow pump of luteinizing hormone from our pituitary and this pumps out and it regulates our ovaries and you know what life is well, life is that whole we, we, you know us being f f fertile and, and that's what our body will try and will try that's where our body will try and set us at as women and so any disturbance to that our body sees as oh what's going on something's going on this isn't a good time to be fertile or this isn't a good time for anything like that so it will pick up on dangers it will pick up on changes in the environment changes in your diet so this is where we can kind of come a little bit undone with fasting women can come a little bit undone because it can cause them to their hormones to go out, your hormones to go out of balance quite quickly so fasting has been shown to re, to help with insulin resistance in terms of if you're insulin resistant, it can help with insulin sensitivity, which is a fantastic thing. And that's a wonderful thing for weight loss. So if you know you're insulin resistant and you know you're, you've got weight problems because of, insulin, because of insulin resistance, you could experiment with fasting to help with your insulin sensitivity. So that's why you could use it. You could experiment with that. As long as you're having you know, good fats and you're having some good proteins, you're having lots and lots of vegetables, you can experiment with fasting, and, you, and when on on the days where you're where you're not fasting, say on the five two diet, you can't be going binging on carbohydrates and sugars because that would make you insulin resistant. You really need to have a healthy diet. So if you're insulin resistant and you want to just see if this will help with your insulin sensitivity, I encourage you to experiment. Make sure that you've got a little blood finger prick and take your blood glucose measurements through the day. See how you're going. Make sure your blood glucose isn't dipping up and down. And experiment with something like the 5-2 diet or intermittent fasting. Because this is where the science is at. The science is at that it does help with insulin resistance and helps with insulin sensitivity. So that is, a, that is an area I would encourage you to experiment if that is an issue with you. Now, what does happen when we fast is it can spike adrenaline and cortisol levels. And also it can raise testosterone levels. So if you've got polycystic ovarian syndrome, if your adrenals are in hyperdrive, 
if your weight, if you're overweight or you can't lose weight because of stress, stress won't make you lose weight. Fasting is stress on your body. So if you've got weight because of, of, because of insulin, you can't lose weight because of insulin resistance, then fasting might well just be the thing that can help you. But if you've got weight due to stress, it doesn't make sense to put more stress on your body. And fasting is stress. Your body sees that as stress. So if you've got weight due to stress, you are stressed. You've got a stressful day, a stressful, a stressful um, environment, or you've got polycystic ovarian syndrome, then fasting won't get you to where you want to go health in terms of your weight. It might make you a little bit more clear. If you suffer from insomnia, if you suffer from anxiety, any of those hyper-driven conditions, you know, you can't sleep, you're always on alert. However, you can, you can be focused during the day, but you do find it hard to get to sleep. Again, fasting might exacerbate those conditions because fasting might be putting the adrenaline up. And we know what adrenaline does. Well, how often is it when you might, example, um, two examples I'll give you. One example, say, you're lying in bed at night and you hear something, you hear a noise outside, and you think, what, what is that? And so suddenly, you hear everything. You're in hyper alert, hyper drive, that's adrenaline. When adrenaline picks in, we've got superhuman powers. We can be stronger, we can, sense. we can hear things we couldn't have heard before, see things, our eyesight, our vision just, you know, we get, that, we get that beautiful vision where we can see all around us almost. So that's what happens with adrenaline. So that's why on fasting, sometimes you do work a little bit better during the day. You've got that adrenaline. That adrenaline makes you focus. That adrenaline makes you solve problems really well. It makes you sit, makes you see things. Don't get tired and you're nice and focused so it can help with that. But on the flip side, if you've got that high adrenaline all day and you're not coming down from the high adrenaline, it can, your hormones can suffer and it can stop you from sleeping. So that's a big issue there. Now, another issue I have, but I haven't seen any studies, is oxytocin. So if you've got low oxytocin, if you're constipated, um, if you had to have an epidural, if, um, if you feel disconnected from the environment, if you feel disconnected from other people, you feel down or you feel different, out of place, or you feel special from the people around us. You could have low oxytocin. Hugging helps with low oxytocin, um, massages, sex, all of that kind of thing. But I suspect that fasting might actually reduce levels of oxytocin. Now, I need to have a look at these studies. They haven't done studies when it comes to fasting, are very few and far between. You know, they've done lots of studies with yeast, lots of studies with worms, lots of studies with mice, but they're not humans. They're not humans having an everyday experience of being late for work, of um, stress, having a stressful family, of losing loved ones. And so it's a human experience that changes how we react to it, how we react to things. So a yeast in a petri dish or a mice, a mouse, will react to things differently than us in a human experience. In a human experience, we are going to react differently. So whenever it comes to everything, anything, I always encourage you to have a have a think about how things make you feel. And so if you're fasting and you're feeling anxious or you're getting constipated or you're not losing weight or you're in hyperdrive, then fasting at that point in your life is not right for you. you know, it's not right for the experiencing the experience you're experiencing. For instance, you know, yogis in India, Gandhi, yogis in India, they do fast for a long, long time, but also at the same time they're sat down cross-legged meditating for hours and hours and hours. Unless you're willing to go meditate for 12 hours a day, your experience is going to be different and fasting is going to have a different impact on you and your hormones. So you really need to look at how you are, how your environment is and what your hormones are doing in the first place. If you've got illnesses due to stress, more stress will compound that. That goes with anything. If you've got a condition that's stressful, if, you're, if you've got hormones due to stress that are out of balance due to stress, if you've got weight, constipation, anything due to stress, if you go and put stress on your body, it's not going to resolve that symptom or that issue. So it's always good to remember that. You've got to step away and actually de-stress. 
So definitely oxytocin. Progesterone is another one. So progesterone has been shown in studies to raise in some studies, lower in other studies. So the studies they've done have been actually on cows who are um, animals. So it's a difficult one. I suspect when I've seen it, when I've seen my clients that have been fasting and we've done hormonal tests, normally they've got hormone resistance. So they've actually got elevated progesterone, but they've got hormone resistance so they can't actually utilize the progesterone that they've got. So this means they're putting a lot of pressure on their bodies, but the hormones, their hormones are kind of at where they should be, but the body, that they're, they're resistant, progesterone resistant, just like estrogen resistant. So I suspect that can happen. We put a lot of pressure on our bodies. So just bear that in mind. <laughs> if you've had your hormones done and you've got super, super elevated progesterone, you really need to work on your nervous system and your stress levels first before you do any fasting. Um, longevity. Longevity is a wonderful um, benefit of fasting. They've shown that, um, that fasting can increase these longevity hormones. Now, these hormones, again, it's good. This is good. It's good. These are longevity hormones. I'm glad it's going to make me younger. These hormones are produced in starvation. They're starvation hormones. So they're produced from a stressful situation. So we have to think, if we're putting our bodies under this stressful situation for a long period of time, that's good. It's producing these anti-aging proteins. But those anti-aging proteins would be produced in starvation. Is this, the best, is this the best thing for my body? So again, go with how you feel. If you feel calm, if you feel clarity through the day, and you're sleeping well, then maybe it's okay for you, but you just need to just need to be aware that these longevity proteins <coughs> are produced in are produced in starvation. So your body, it's, which is a stressful a stressful situation. So that's just another thing um, to bear in mind. Um, I did also want to talk about. Um, just, I've got some questions here that I just wanted to have a look at and just remind myself about these questions. Um, did we talk about IGF-1, the growth factor? I just wanted to quickly... So IGF-1 is a growth hormone that is produced in the liver. That has been shown in studies to go up with fasting. Now let's think about that again. So we have to think about this. There aren't tons and tons of studies done. Like I say, there's studies done on yeast, there's studies done on mice, there's studies done on fungi, but we're not yeast. Well, we kind of are a bacteria, but they, they have a, you know, they're pretty chilled out in their Petri dish. So when we look at cancer, if we look at cancer, there's two schools of thought with fasting. And I am going to go into these in a little bit more detail tomorrow. I'm just literally giving you um, a, a brain dump overview, um, just in case anything does relate. But if we look at cancer... Fasting has been shown to fight cancer because you're starving the cancer cells, which is fantastic. We can you starve the sugar, starve the food source, and hopefully reduce the cancer. But here's the catch-22. If we raise IGF-1 levels, they are a growth hormone. So any growth hormone causes proliferation of tissue. And so our tissue keeps turning over. So I suspect cancers like uterus, um, uh, cervical cancer, those kind of cancers, definitely on those kind of skins, bowel cancer, cervical cancer, mucous membrane cancer. I suspect that fasting, if you have a cancer like that, this is my suspicion, can actually proliferate those cells too quickly and can speed up the rate of the cancer growth. So if you're prone to cervical cancer, um, bowel cancer, um, any of esophageal cancer, you've had any of those cancers, I would, I would actually err on the side of caution and I wouldn't. If you had something going on in the brain, you could use ketosis maybe with a brain tumor or a brain cancer and you could see how that goes experiment. But any fast turnover, those cells in your cervix turn over so quick. They turn over so quick. So if we're speeding up the growth, within days they can grow. The same with they can go within days. That's a beautiful thing about those cancers. They can turn over quite quick and go if they don't set foothold. So with the IGF-1, if you're fasting and you do have any of those those cancers, those or those or you're prone to those cancers, or a family history of those cancers, or those estrogen dominant cancers, I would be very careful because of that IGF one. I would get mine tested in my bloods. 
IGF-1 is a beautiful growth hormone. So if you're fatigued, if you're underweight, if you're poor muscle mass, poor bone mass, um, slow growth in kids, all of those kind of things, the IGF-1 can help with that. But on the flip side, it can cause cancer proliferation. So I just wanted to touch on that. So I think I've touched on everything I wanted to touch on today. And I haven't actually answered your questions, but what I've done is I have gone through a real overview. It's just really a brain dump. It's an overview of the things fasting can affect, the goods, the bads, the ugly. Um, so tomorrow I'm going to do specific questions, and I'm going to try and tie it all together and give you some great takeaways in terms of who should, who shouldn't fast, and what's the best fasting. But my thoughts right now, definitely with women, you know, fasting is not the best way to go. It's not the best way for hormones. But having said that, it's good to have some macronutrient fast. It's good to fast all through the night. So, you know, 12 to 15 hours of fasting is, is beautiful. That's plenty. And then you get up and you have a really healthy, great breakfast. So I help, hope you found that helpful today. I was just chatting, chatting, chatting. I think it's because it's such a big subject. And after researching it and seeing clients that are doing it and seeing so many people fasting, it's actually, we, we really need to talk about this and we really need to talk about how does it work with women? Is it the best thing? And there are other things going on that we actually don't understand and don't realize in terms of our hormones and our endorphins. Um, and all of that. So I hope you found that helpful. So tomorrow I'm going to be back on. I'm going to be answering specific questions. Hi, Veronica. So tomorrow I'm going to be back on at 11, 11 a.m. in the morning. And I'm going to go over some specific questions. I've had specific questions about fasting. Is the 16-8 good? And I've already answered that one. The 16-8 is fine, you know, as long as it's overnight. Uh, you have a good night's sleep. If you fast and you've got insomnia, that's not good. That's not a good thing. So there are some, you know, you've really got to make sure your health is in a good place before you experiment with not eating for long periods of time. <coughs> okay, so, um, so tomorrow at 11 a.m. I'm going to be answering specific questions. And I'm also going to then just give an overview of today and give you some good key takeaway points to help you understand if fasting is right for you. Veronica, thank you so much for joining. Really appreciate it. And I hope you have a beautiful day, Veronica. Enjoy the sunshine. Get out, go for a walk, maybe do some yoga. I know you'll enjoy that. So take care, everybody. Have a wonderful day. And I'll see you tomorrow at 11.